Okay, well, first, uh, I, of course, I want to thank the, the organizers for giving me a chance to be here, but also for organizing not just the conference, but also the entire program, right? I myself have benefited a number of times of collaborations that were born through this uh, TITP program, right? So I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. And so my talk, although it has this long and not very creative to uh, uh, title, right, is really uh, uh, a simple story, right? It is a story of three experiments in one quest, okay? So uh, these three experiments, they highlight different aspects of the same problem, the field body problem. And the quest is to learn how to build more realistic field body models, right? Because we want to ultimately have a predictive power. Right. A lot of universality that we do is beautiful, of course, but uh, sometimes some of the methods don't, don't have the predictive power that experiments need in order to give further steps. Right. So in this first, uh, so I, I don't feel like I, I, I need to go much on the potassium-39 experiments like Eric was talking this morning, right. but basically it highlights the long range physics of the problem. And uh, uh, the studies that I have been doing with Johannes Denschlag, right, that were born here in 2016, we started this collaboration in 2016, uh, uh, they explore a, a very different regime. It's the, it, it, so we gain information about short range physics. Right? In lithium, it's kind of both. Right? The short range physics seems to be more important than usual. Right? In, in the FMOV uh, context, right? So this is a, a fancier way, right? So to, 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 to look at the problems that I'm looking at this, multi-channel multi effects that comes out in FMOV physics. Uh, in this, effect, this work has more a chemistry appeal, right? Because we are lo looking to propensity rules of this uh, two-body recombination. And again, lithium evolves is all the things mixed up, okay? So uh, let me just put in here uh, uh, what we have uh, uh, understood, right? Uh, uh, this is about 10 years old, right? This theory in which you, 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 we, we found that for atomic systems, uh, the three-body parameter, right? Which sets basically the three-body observables, it depends only on the van der Waals length. And that was, of course, driven by the overwhelming experimental evidence, right? This is a theory that was built to explain these experiments, right? And in fact, you, you can see here, right? In this plot, I'm showing the, the, what we call the A minus parameter, which is the value of the scatoline in which the, the, the F mod resonance becomes bound on the negative scatoline, and that's measured for atomic losses. And you can see that for a wide, a range of values of this parameter here, rest, rest, which is characterized the strength of the resonance, right? It belongs within a 15% from the universal prediction, which would be this 9.73, okay? I was, of course, extremely pleased when I see that at first, right? Uh, but then later on, I started realizing that there's something else here going on, all right? Because the, the, the narrowness of the resonance should matter, all right? That's based on uh, some previous work from Dima, right? Dima Petrov. Uh, we have explored some things like that that we see. And of course, uh, Schmidt and, and Zweger, uh, uh, we see a strong dependence on the F1 physics on the resonance strength, all right? In particular, you can see here in this theory it is, a, it is a simple theory in a sense, it's a, just a one channel prediction, but I don't think it should be wrong. Right? I think this theory is consistent to, to what I was found in this previous work. So this was very puzzling for me to see that some atomic species here, mainly, well, there's a cesium case here, potassium and so on, that you don't see a strong deviation from universality. And, and that was what really one of the drivers to, to, to elaborate a model that contains most of the physics 
that is controlling the, 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 the different characters of the resonances. Uh, here I'm just showing the, 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 the youngest data point here, I think is the youngest data point, but uh, from the experiments from GILA. Okay, extremely accurate and, and, and theory has been shown a very good agreement to that, right? So again, I'm gonna capitalize from what uh, Eric has already said, right? So I, I, I just wanna give you an idea of how these models that are built, right? Uh, we know, oops, for uh, in atomic physics, the interaction between the particles is mainly comes from electronic interactions, right? And we, we decompose the interaction in terms of a singlet and a triplet component, okay? And you can see the, these potentials are very well calculated and, and refined by feedback from the experiments, right? And uh, one point that I wanna make right now for this talk is that the van der Waals length, which is related to the, the, the tail of this potential is not the only length scale relevant on the uh, two body problem. We also have the, the exchange, exchange, I'm calling here exchange radius, right? Which is when the energy between the singlet and triplet potentials is comparable to the van der Waals energy, okay? And that gives you a length scale, and that length scale tells you more or less when the, the electronic clouds are starting feeding each other. Normally, for, for most alkali atoms, this is about 20 bar, right? And, uh, uh, and 20 bar for most alkalis, it is very small compared to, to the van der Waals length, but not always, okay? Uh, so to mimic, to deal numerically with this problem, right? I cannot use the potentials like this, right? Just the numerical, uh, the, 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 the memory and CPU time requirements would be uh, too high, right? But the best point is that we don't need to, right? We don't need to use that. So what we do uh, is to use reduced models, uh, a model for a singlet and a triplet potential where I adjust these parameters here to reproduce the real singlet and triplet scatter length. Okay, this model has some limitations. I call this the first generation. Uh, it was what I used for potassium 39, but I uh, right now for leaching, for instance, I'm using more the second generation. Uh, it has some limitations here that uh, uh, I don't think is worth discussing right, right now. But here on the second model, uh, we are really using, getting the, the, the real ab initial potentials, these guys here, and I add something here that cut off, make this potential shallower. They make it shallower, but it still captures some of the electronic, the real electronic exchange in the problem, right? And that has been shown to be much more accurate, right? And we can really reproduce very uh, complicated flash bar resonances that uh, appears in a problem that gives, and so we can easily uh, fit to, to give because I still have to do some fine tuning to get a, a, a accurate feeding here, uh, but we can describe basically any fresh bar resonance. Uh, in the case of potassium 39, right, what I just wanna highlight here is some of the comparisons because our picture was always to say that potassium 39 is anomalous, right? It's not really fitting into the usual universal picture. Right. And we see that by comparing some observables for negative scatter land is the three-body recombination. We see the universal prediction would be around 600 bar. Right. Our theory uh, gives a, a closer results to, to a closer uh, result to the experiment. But interestingly enough, right, our theory can also predict, it, 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 it can reproduce the inelasticity parameter, which is this parameter that captures uh, the amplitude of the rates. It's a, typically a thought has a global parameter, but uh, it's related to the lifetime of the FMOD states and so on. And this theory can reproduce that. Right? So we can uh, start feeling secure that, oh, we, cannot, we, can, we can only predict both the, the position and the lifetime of these resonances. And in this particular case here, for, uh, which was one observable uh, closest to the, the, the smallest value in the scatter and we, we don't get an extremely good comparison for the eta parameter, but I, 
I blame that mostly on the limitations of the first generation of this model, right? I, I want to do these calculations now with a newer model and see how that goes. But otherwise, for the, this other uh, atom diamond resonance, for instance, we can get a pretty good comparison in, in both position and the, the, the eta parameter. Uh, what I want to say here, right, and highlight is that in this particular case, right, our model can now uh, uh, look to the FMOB states right, that are causing these resonances in the, the atom dimer threshold and point out the, the, uh, how the lifetime is uh, uh, behaving for these trimers. Like in this case, this, uh, correspond, this peak here corresponded to the first excited trimer state. Right, the, these error bars in this figure uh, are the, the correspond to the width of the state, okay? And here we can find that uh, lifetimes between 10 microseconds and 100 microseconds, right? Which would be enough to do some stuff with these states. But the ground state is extremely short-lived, is under a microsecond. So this, and of course, there's this, interesting feature here that the ground state seems to be uh, the, the less point here. I think that, I think this, you can never get smaller scattering in this case uh, for this particular resonance, but this trimer here was almost unbinding here right, for, for this particular. So this level of, uh, 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 oh, just one more comment here. I forgot to say that uh, to get a good value for eta, Right, you do need the hyperfine interactions. I have used models that I don't have hyperfine interactions. I get the position correct, but I don't get eta correct. So this is, uh, uh, now we think we have a tool that we can start looking for better conditions, uh, better atomic species, better resonances, uh, so to find where is a place where the, this, uh, the physics is less lossy, right, where we can find uh, uh, long-lived FMOB states, for instance. Uh, so understanding, have this power, right, of uh, uh, looking to the, to, to, to the short-range physics, which controls the, the, the lifetimes, it is really important. And there's a lot of advances that have been made here by the uh, Johannes group uh, uh, that have been, at least I get involved in this project in, on 2016 from my conversations with Paul. And the idea here is to dig into the losses. And we, does, we don't only wanna know uh, uh, how much is lost. We wanna understand how is lost and lost to where, right? where it's going. All right, so three body recombination, which is the process we are looking. Uh, uh, in this picture, this is a hyperspherical picture. So R is the hyper radius, represents the overall size of the system. And it starts over here above zero. That's the threshold, three body threshold, breakup threshold. And you have three rubidium atoms colliding and they are gonna get to some distance, go through in the last transitions and leave uh, the particle with high kinetic energy, all right? And typically, that's enough, and that's what most experiments have done so far, is to look at the atom loss. Right? You just see that your atom is being lost, but you don't know exactly where it's going. But in these experiments on uh, Johannes group, and Johannes is probably gonna give a, a much better explanation of how, of how the, the experiment works, it happens uh, in the presence of ionization, ionization uh, field. So as soon the molecule is formed, Right, it's immediately ionized. Once the molecule is ionized, it's easy to keep track. Right, and this molecule is gonna collide with other atoms and, and generate a lot of losses. And that these losses, the, the loss signals are very strong. So basically each line dip here was a particular molecular state that was populated. So we can trace back and look to, to, to these questions, right? We can now ask, oh, is there any product uh, uh, propensity rule for, the, propo uh, for the, the product state? Is there something that we can learn? Right? Is there any universality here? Right? And the question, of course, is yes. The answer is yes, right? And that was really remarkable. Uh, uh, in this, this is a, 
a paper that is cooking in the oven right now, right? But it should be out in a, pretty soon. Uh, uh, and here I'm showing to you the three body recombination rate has a function of the binding energy of the final product, right? And what have we found? Oh, it, and, okay. Uh, uh, color curves, co color symbols are experiment and, and black symbols are theory, all right? You can see that we are dividing here. I'm artificially shifting the, 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 this slope here. All right, so you can see the different partial waves of the molecule uh, more clearly, or else this would be all mixed up, all right? And we can see clearly that there is a, a, a overall trend here, what we call, what, what we are saying, in this plot here, is that this curve here is one over the binding energy, all right? Of course, if you look numerically and ask for the, the optimal slope, it's something close to one, all right? So close to negative one, all right? But you can see a, 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 a pretty good agreement between theory and experiments, in particular, some oscillations when it goes up or one goes down. And that's something that I actually didn't think was possible before I, I started this collaboration. So I was really, really happy with that. And of course, we also have a, a, a understanding of how this is, why this is happening, right? One key aspect here is that the body recombination still happens at very large distances, which end up allowing us to derive uh, expressions that give the rough behavior uh, of the final state distribution and point out that there is a term here that is, a, is responsible for interference of this chemical process. So we, we are analyzing the pathways of that. that would, could be responsible for oscillations like this. But we also found that a similar product state distribution exists for rubidium 85, right? So there is some universality in this problem. Although uh, a more mysterious propensity rule wasn't immediately clear to us uh, that was uh, the reasons why it was happening. The experiment, it happens to observe only molecules which have the same spin states of the, the three atoms, right? That's a very strong propensity rule, right? Even because this is a two-body process, the two-body spin should not be conserved, right? I mean, it's not necessarily conserved, right? So that was really intriguing. And we'd have to dig up in this problem until we find, a, a, of course, a, 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 a reasonable explanation for this. Uh, in this case, uh, here, this figure I'm showing that it would be 85 molecular spectrum. It's quite complicated. There's a lot of information on it. But what it matters is that Ruby 85, they have this, it has this kind of families uh, of three families. I'm showing there are five, but I'm, I'm showing just three of them here. And this family here is the family where that uh, have the observed molecular state. The number in parentheses represents the fraction of the, the, the molecule in which uh, uh, that belongs on the same spin of the atoms. So you see that when this number is close to one, right, you see the population of that state. When this number is very small to one, you just don't see that molecular state, okay? And of course, as you go deeper, this is gonna change, but we still were not able to, to uh, to get there experimentally to, to, to test this. So how did this propensity rule would change, which probably would, will. Um, all these calculations that I'm showing here are single channel calculations. It doesn't have spin, right? And that's a special case. So learning how to build real models, it's also learning how, when you don't need to, to be that realistic. In this case is one of the cases that a single channel works well. All right. But still, we, 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 we expand our, these, these models to do a, a calculation with spins for Ruby 85. So we can really see numerically the propensity rule. All right. And then, oops. Uh, and then we, we, we see the states in red are the molecules that has the same states, uh, spin of the atoms and they are clearly dominant. And I was a bit surprised to see a number of molecular states here with have different symmetry but they are pretty close to the detection limit, 
right? So we might want to revisit these molecular lines and see what, what, what is happening there. But clearly there's a bunch of states here that are just forbidden, okay? So uh, um, how am I with time? 10 minutes, okay. All right, I didn't see your 15 minutes warning. Uh, one point here that I would like to make in the context of uh, uh, universality now, uh, half of our physics, is that the rubidimity five primer that was observed is the one that has the longest lifetime, right? Which has this eta parameter to be a 0.06, right? Typically it's about two, right? And I wonder here if that's related with this spin propensity rule, because it, this spin propensity rule is saying that for, for rubidimity five, most of the spin channels are not going to be accessible. Most of the molecules there are not going to be populated. So the trimer has less pathways to decay. So it can live longer, right? Uh, one, one could do an experiment into this, creating a trimer and seeing the final products you get. You can ionize and you can, the problem is to, to populate the trimer, right? Uh, and that also makes me wonder, Ruby 87 also has this strong spin propensity rule, right? If one wants to explore a small physics of potassium of uh, Ruby 87, well, perhaps we, we can see some longer lifetimes there, right? So it's important to understand this, this spin physics because that, that can help you to decide uh, uh, which states to look at. So in this journey, right, I was thinking everything is doing well. We are understanding, get good agreements with experiments and so on until I get my hands on lithium-7. Right, now I understand what it means to work with lithium. Uh, so let me show you, reframe, reframe the initial discussion, right, uh, that I already anticipate. Uh, that this deviation, so right? we understand potassium 39 very well. We understand rubidium 85. I also checked the small resonance for rubidium 85. Everything looks good with spins with this model, but it's still, we don't know what is happening with this two K, this with a number of cases here, right? The lithium, there's a cesium and there's two potassium here. They are, they should have a, uh, a minus parameter is way larger than is actually seen in our, and the thing that these guys have in common is that they are all narrow resonances. Uh, for the case of lithium, lithium seven, uh, the, the spin channels that have been studied experimentally are very well known. Uh, you have the, the AA channel, which is for this particular hyperfine state and what we call the BB channel, which is for this pair of hyperfine states. Of course, the BB, uh, channel is slightly complicated by the fact that you have this uh, overlapping resonances, but we can describe this overlapping pretty well. My point here I'm also sh is that I'm also showing the effective range, right? If I look at the effective range coming out of this uh, 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 initial calculation and compare it to the, what the single channel theory would give, right, you can see clearly deviations from single channel. Uh, especially on the BB channel, okay? So multi-channel effects are particularly important for lithium-7. And so my idea was to revisit this data, right? Here we are seeing, uh, when I saw this, this for the first time, this, this data, I was really excited. And I'm still excited, of course, <laughs> yeah, perhaps more than before. Uh, but I thought, well, that's a case where everything fit, fits together. Do right? you have this, this nice curve here, which is a fitting to the zero range theory, right? And you can extract these values, A minus and for eta, and uh, agrees well with the universal theory. And, and there's actually both uh, spins here. There's the BBB and the AAA spins. So, so those two different hyperfine states. When I do a, my calculation using all this hard work of doing uh, a realistic model, what I get is completely disaster, all right? So am I lost all my time, all right? Or I'm not understanding something, all right? My first point here is that 
what I see here, what I see is a F mob resonance. This, the, this panel here is basically the K3, the recombination rate divided by A to the four. So it, it basically flats this, this curve that you're seeing here, all right? And here, I still have calculations running right now to resolve these features, but my F mob resonance is about 50 times the Van der Waals length, all right? It is there and in a way consistent to, to uh, Schmidt uh, and Zweggers, right? They, they were predicting a value of negative 21, but I don't, I'm not expecting quantitative comparisons with them, all right? But they are basically saying it should be in a much larger scale, okay? And it's also consistent with uh, unpublished calculations that Paul has done with Yu Jun Wang. And that also display a FML resonance to a much larger value, okay? So uh, we are recruiting people, all right? I've been in touch with Servaz and we are collaborating this project and probably some other ones, right? We have been exchanging a lot of information. He has a very good uh, uh, spin model for three bodies. And, and he has also found similar results. He's refining his results, but so, we have one, two, three, four calculations that are consistent with each other, which do not agree with the experiment. So I don't know what you did, Lev. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, uh, because for me, what intrigues in, in, me into all this, at least in my numerical calculations, is that my resonance appears at value of scattering larger than 22.7. We know that for F mod theory, right? Oh, three minutes. Uh, you would expect that if you change your scattering by a factor 22.7, right? You should expect seeing one F mod resonance. Here, I had to change the, the, the factor by factor 50. So there is something going on, right? And I, I need to apologize. This figure probably has more information that you, you, you want to know. All right, like the dashed lines, please don't ignore that. It's just, uh, for some experts, all right, uh, 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 the dashed lines are just the potential. The red lines is the potential plus the diagonal Q. So that's the effective three body potentials, all right? And when I start looking to lithium seven, well, of course I found some uh, area assemblies, right? I, I saw that, uh, that there is a typical uh, universal barrier around twice the Van der Waals length, so good. Right, that's not really what's going on there. Right, it's pretty similar to, similar to, to what we've seen for broad resonances. The difference is that this guy is slightly deeper. Right, this goes up to one times the Van der Waals energy. This one goes to almost three. Right, so it's slightly deep and actually can hold a, a state there. If you want to call that F mode state or not, we can debate that, but it holds one state. The different thing is that there is an additional barrier here. These are the potentials on resonance when this scattering is infinity. This barrier is not present for broad resonances. And the real F mod physics, right, it happens at a larger distance. So at short distance, you have a, still have this attraction, comes with a barrier. This attraction binds one state, and all other f mode states are gonna bound only at much large distances. And that explains why I'm seeing the f mode resonance at much larger schedule end, but still don't explain the experiment, all right? So we start thinking, what is special about uh, lithium-7, all right? So we have to put together all the numbers and analyze the different species. And the first thing that comes out is that D27 has the smallest hyperfine splitting, right? The ratio between the hyperfine energy splitting to the Van der Waals length is basically one, right? All the other alkalis have a much larger hyperfine spin. So that's an indication that the, all the spin channels are much more squeezed and then the spins are, spin physics is gonna be more important. And the other thing is that lithium, lithium six or seven has the smallest Van der Waals length and the smallest and comparable to the exchange radius, which is about, so the, this is about 30, this is about 20. And again, the exchange radius is, it tells you when the electron clouds start overlapping. 
And to me, that means that when you bring the third particle, the electron cloud or the third particle is also going to start overlapping, which is an indication that perhaps we might need a three body force. Right? And if you look up on, on the literature on what is available today, right, you can see that, yes, for lithium, lithium has the strongest three body forces for all species. Uh, and of course, we have serious people now looking to this problem more closely as a collaboration that's being stimulated again by KITP. Right? And uh, Michal Tonza is gonna be doing uh, all this analysis right, better than we have, uh, uh, we would ever be able to do it. And I just wanna show here to, to end this, uh, end the suffering, is that if I include uh, a three body force in my calculations, right? I can of course adjust this and, and, and obtain a, a very good agreement with the experiment. But what I want to emphasize here is that not only fix the position, but cor correct the amplitude. Uh, so the, the three body force is attractive three body force that has a form like this, that is pushing more amplitude for short distances and that automatically corrects the amplitude in there. So. I'm in an uncomfortable position now to say that to, of course, there's a lot of things to be analyzed, but it's very uncomfortable to say that uh, lichen depends on a three body force, but that three body force conspires to put the resonance where the universal result is, all right? So we need to build up a multiple efforts with people calculating three body force to make a strong statement about this, because it's gonna basically, to prove that something is coincidental is always harder. Right. Okay, well, thanks for your attention. I'm just gonna leave this slide here with some of my thoughts. Okay, thank you. All right, he squeaked it out. Uh, do we have any questions? I have a question about, a, about your potential model. That means you said that the, you, the only scales you introduce in the end are this exchange uh, radius, the van der Waals, and then the, the potential uh, becomes softer, right? I have this a is repulsive what... portion there. These potentials are numerical potentials. Yes, yeah, but right? there are, you said that they are a little softer than the original. I add something to soften this yes, potential, so, so I don't have... So we, you lose in some way some uh, uh, low, um, low range, infor uh, small range informations. You, you kind of... Uh, Renormalize this part, but means yeah. so, you so can think in, in terms of cut off. Yeah, my question right. is uh, why does it work well uh, on the rubidium rubidium case where you you want to uh, address uh, explicitly the uh, short range uh, uh, interaction? Because for rubidium, this is about 20 bar for all alkalis, and rubidium the the the, the van der Waals length is about 80. This term here falls off exponentially, so it becomes increasingly unimportant at, as you go to, to a larger interatomic distance. So for rubidium 87, recombination really happens around the, 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 the van der Waals length, which is very far away from where this electronic exchange is important. So in some way, in some way you are not so uh, short range as uh, you, Yes, for recombination. Yes, for recombination. Yeah. Okay, short range for me, it's anything smaller than uh, Van der Waals length, yeah. okay, or comparable. Because, so in, because the, in some way, the surprise is that you don't need a free body force here in yes. the Rubinian Rubinian. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's a good point. I forgot to mention that uh, uh, three body forces are going to be important when electronic exchanges are important. So for Rubinian, because that physics happen around Van der Waals length and the electronic radius, it is so small, three body forces are not important, all right? So the three particles have to get that close. Thanks. My question is related to, to this one. If I remember correctly, the lithium polarizability is 100 times bigger than for helium-4. 
-hmm. Is that the only parameter that gives you the importance of the three body force or are the level of spacing are also, what, what gives you the importance of that? Well, uh, it, I think it's all related, all right? The, the polarizability is going to be related to C6, which is related to the Van der Waals length. And to the now the question- excitations? I'm sorry? To the level excitations, the energy excitation does? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I'm following the, the question really, but uh, 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 what is really controlling whether or not three-body forces is important right, is a question that we, we want to learn how to answer, okay? At this point, right, the information that, what I can tell you is that you have the separation of, uh, the, separation of uh, the length scale associated with electronic exchange and the Van der Waals length, which is where f mod physics happens, is not very well pronounced for lithium. Okay. Hi, Andrew. Um, uh, you show this um, pure number, which is minus nine, which is the A minus uh, divided the Van der Waals length. Mm -hmm. There is another pure number uh, that I saw in the literature that is the A minus times K star that for Van der Waals species uh, uh, was analysis to give minus, around minus two for all the Van der Waals species. Sure. You can calculate uh, for the, in your case, what is uh, this pure number A minus times K star K star being the the is the, the, is the three body parameter. Yeah, yeah. It's, it gives the energy at unitary. Okay. Uh, energy of the trimer ground state at unitarity. Yes, uh, it's, okay. it's the in the same branch. Mm -hmm. A minus is related to kappa to K star. Mm -hmm. And I saw uh, in the literature that uh, was analyzed for Van der Waals species, and in, in all cases having more than one bound state or more bound state is around minus two, minus 2.2. Okay. So in this case, you have this other pure number that uh, to understand if also this pure number uh, goes away from universality. Sure, yeah, yeah, one should check that. That's another way to measure of how universal your system is. Right. I ask in this because why are you sure that at the A minus point, you know the Van der Waals length? Uh, well, because the it's the scale potential there. You change the potential going up there. It's not no. the free potential. Because yeah, the potential, the singlet and triplet potential never change. you apply the, the, the phase bar resonance, so the interaction is changing. No. The, the singlet and triplet interactions never change. They are purely electronic interactions. What I change is the hyperfine with the hyperfine physics. And that's what is causing the change on the scatoler. Uh, so the interaction- But the, the energy of the state change. Yes. So which, which state? The energy of the state is the, changing. The two body state? No, no, the three body energy yes. is changing. It's changing and is driven by hyperfine by the magnetic field. Yes. Not um, by the changes on the- so you are sure system. that I minus, uh, you know the exactly the Van der Waals yes. length? Yeah, the Van, the, Waals, the Van der Waals length is always the same for for all values of the scatter and I, I show here. But in general, when you go to that point, I saw that uh, in the literature, they multiply the, for example, for helium, helium potential, or I saw in other cases, they multiply the potential by uh, extreme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the strengths modify all the potential. No, no, I know, I know. But in the other models, yeah. Eh? In the other models, that's all. But I, I, in the I, other I, models, I, so the, 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 the Van der Waals length is changing. Slightly. Yeah. Slightly. Yeah. And you see, when you multiply your potential by a lambda, I think in helium, uh, people have done this, right? You multiply the, the helium potential by a factor there, you are effectively changing the Van der Waals length. But is a change is 
But if you lambda is the parameter I'm multiplying, it's lambda to the one fourth. All right. It's very small. It's, it is very slowly changing. All right. But uh, maybe I think Dorota, you have used this kind of uh, approaches yeah, before. Yeah, I mean, when we do it, we you know we just use the scaling factor, but then when we calculate ratios or report the van der Waals lengths, it's the van der Waals lengths at that particular scattering length. Okay. So we we take into account that. Um, there's a scaling factor. Okay. But I mean, what Jose is doing is better than just having an overall scaling factor because mm -hmm. he's really mimicking how the hyperfine structure is changing. So it's different from an overall scaling factor, as both Chris and Jose pointed out. Okay, I need to understand how to implement this trick. <laughs> Chris? Uh, Jose? Me first? Oh. Okay, Jose. And uh, have you looked at the tetramers when you have this? Uh, not yet. No. <laughs> and not in a very long time. Right. It's just the, 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 the degree of numerical complexity that involves already on the three body level. It, for me, I, I still want to just look to that. Could, could you put that slanting graph that had all the different orders of magnitude uh, from earlier in the talk, um, shifted by two orders of magnitude, all the different, I guess uh, that was the rubidium, okay. rubidium, rubidium. Getting there. Yeah, so. What's interesting to me is it seems to me like if you had not shifted them, these would all go up and the recombination rate would largely be independent of angular momentum. It only yes. depends on the binding energy. Yes. Yeah. Do you have an interpretation of that? Well, in, in, in the, when I do uh, this simple analytical model that I, uh, I didn't have, have a chance to show here, it does depend on, uh, because in the final channel, right, the way photo, it, it doesn't matter really uh, the, the, the L, right, it's always oscillating, right? So, uh, so what it matters are things like energy normalization and of the state, and that depends on the energy of the, the molecule, right? Not really on L, right? So when I, you can do some simple models and just consider the asymptotic form of the wave function and you get this. There's uh, some additional tricks, but L never really played a role there. And my reasoning really was that the, fun, the exit channel, right, which is a, a channel with very high velocity, right, the solution is a sine KR plus pi over two L. Well, it's actually a Bessel function. Well, but a Bessel function for a, a, a very large R, so which is a sine function. Well, it's, I, I mean... It could be, Chris. It could be there is some dependence, but it, because there is some oscillations, if you, look, if you see here, uh, it is, it's just hard to map out. But is already the gross behavior is this largely independent on L. Yeah, I was just going to comment on that question that the um, this is actually a really compressed log scale. And if you actually plot these on a linear scale, same vibration, but vibration, you'll definitely see some oscillations. They go up and down factors of two or four or five. So you, you will see some change. Although broadly speaking, on a big picture like this, they, they look uniform. But I was really surprised by that too. You are coming with three atoms with zero angular momentum, and you kind of go more or less in the same way. You can produce uh, L equals ten molecule in the more or less same order of magnitude you produce uh, L equals zero molecule. So there is a lot of momentum transfer going on. Right. Uh, angular momentum transfer. Any further questions? I have a short question. Um, when you give a 
values to your three body force for, for from where you you know the parameters to to keep. look at i don't all right and that's where uh how is going to make the difference all right i i pick a two body force that have the same functional form the two body the two body electronic exchange all right and but i use that to fit the experiment all right but knowing better how these uh, two body surfaces look like all right i might be able to confirm that what i have been using it is reasonable so you made a parameter check search yeah all right last comment so I'm, I'm a little puzzled by this because we already know the realistic two-body potentials are not particularly useful because they're too deep. Mm -hmm. They have to be rescaled by, I don't know what, two orders of magnitude? Uh, for little, not that much, but yeah. So, well, I mean, you'll have to rescale the three bodies, a uh, comparable amount. And okay, so Mika will be able to predict the shape of that, I guess, but but it'll be rescaled by some arbitrary number in yeah. the end, and it's not so clear to me that that's going to tell you any more than your fitted three-body term you're using right now. Yeah, essentially, what I want to know, Chris, it is the value of the three-body force near the van der Waals length. Is that larger? or smaller than the, van der, the two body forces. So I can get an idea that near the van der Waals length, one would expect a sizable correction. I'm, I don't think we are gonna be able to, to, to plug that surfaces all right, uh, to, to the calculations, but we can get an insight of knowing the, the, the relative strength of the three body force compared but, to the But at body. that radius, you know it's axelrod Teller. All right. It, yes, it can it could be. I don't accept that. Uh, there are cookies it waiting could be. for us. Yeah. There be. are cookies and cupcakes in the courtyard, and I fear we were going to have to continue this discussion yeah. over sweet sugar. All right. Thank you to both of our speakers again. <laughs>